Welcome to another Murder Mindset. This series will be looking at the most prolific serial killers from each state in the USA. In episode 1 we will be covering serial killers from or who operated in the states of Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, and California. If you enjoy the video, why not subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with all of our latest content. But for now thanks for watching and let's get into it. Daniel Lee Siebert, born June 17, 1954, was an American serial killer on Alabama's death row. He was convicted of three murders and confessed to at least five. During questioning, he indicated that he was responsible for at least 12 deaths. Sherry Weathers, a hearing-impaired student at the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind in Talladega, had missed a week of classes without explanation when her counselor phoned the manager of her apartment building for help on February 24, 1986. Weathers did not answer her phone, and the school was concerned that something might be wrong. The manager used her passkey and found Sherry dead in her room, along with her two small sons, five-year-old Chad and four-year-old Joseph. The bodies were piled together on Sherry's bed and loosely covered with a blanket. When police arrived, the manager directed them to another apartment, occupied by 33-year-old Linda Jarman, another student lately missing from the institute. Inside, patrolmen found her nude and lifeless on the bed, a television set, and the woman's car apparently stolen by her assailant. Investigation revealed that an institute art teacher, one Daniel Spence, had expressed a romantic interest in Sherry Weathers. Missing from class since February 20th, Spence had turned up at the school several months earlier, offering to teach for free in hopes of gaining a permanent job later on. Fingerprints from the Talladega murder scenes identified Spence as Daniel Siebert, convicted of a Las Vegas manslaughter in 1979, presently sought in San Francisco on charges of first-degree assault. Detectives also learned that Siebert had been dating Linda Odom, a 32-year-old cocktail waitress reported missing on February 24th. Her naked, decomposed remains were found outside of Talladega on March 30th. Independent evidence also linked Siebert with the strangulation of a prostitute in Calhoun County, found around the time he disappeared from Talladega. Highway Patrol officers found Linda Odom's car abandoned near Elizabethtown, Kentucky on March 3, 1986, and Siebert's fingerprints were lifted from the vehicle. Over the next six months, sightings of the fugitive were reported from Ohio, New Jersey, Nevada, Southern California, and Montreal, Canada. The first solid lead was delivered on September 3rd, when a Las Vegas friend of Siebert's reported a telephone call from the fugitive. Police were ready when the next call came, and it was traced to a payphone in Nashville, Tennessee. Employees at a nearby restaurant identified Siebert's mugshots, and he was arrested next morning when he arrived to complete some work on the restaurant's sign. In custody, Siebert readily confessed to five murders in Alabama and various others spanning the continent. How many? Maybe a dozen, he said. Maybe more. I try to put those things out of my mind. He killed for purposes of sex and robbery, being careful to murder his victims after a San Francisco hooker survived a throttling and filed charges against him. In addition to the Alabama cases, Siebert was charged with the 1985 murders of 28-year-old Gidget Castro and 23-year-old Nasia McElrath in Los Angeles, both previously attributed to the elusive South Side Slayer. He was also charged in the 1986 strangulation of 57-year-old Beatrice McDougall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and authorities announced that they were checking other unsolved homicides in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Florida. On March 21, 1987, Siebert was convicted of Linda Jarman's murder in Talladega, receiving a sentence of death. Siebert died on April 22, 2008 in Holman Prison near Atmore of complications from cancer. Robert Christian Hansen was born February 15, 1939 in Esterville, Iowa. Hansen is an American serial killer who flew his victims into the Alaskan wilderness and hunted them down like wild game. Hansen, who as a child was small and sickly with perpetual acne and a severe stutter, spent much of his early life as a loner and a target for bullying from his peers and his strict domineering father. He married in 1960. On December 7th of that year, he was arrested for burning down a local school bus garage, a crime for which he served 20 months in prison. His wife divorced him while he was incarcerated. Over the next few years, he was jailed several more times for petty theft. 
and drifted through a series of menial jobs. In 1967, he moved to Anchorage, Alaska, seeking a fresh start with his second wife, whom he had married in 1963. While he was well-liked by his neighbors and was famed as a local hunting champion, his life eventually fell into disarray again. In 1977, he was imprisoned for theft, diagnosed with bipolar affective disorder, and prescribed lithium to control his mood swings. He was never officially ordered to take the medication, however, and was released from prison after serving a year. By now the father of two children, Hansen opened his own bakery after his release and was widely thought of as a pillar of his community. He began killing prostitutes around 1980. He would pay them for sex and kidnap and rape them once they were in his power. He would then fly them out to his cabin in the Nick River Valley in his private plane and stalk and kill them with a hunting knife and a .223 caliber Mini-14 rifle. On June 13, 1983, one of his victims escaped and told the Anchorage police what he had done to her. Hansen denied the accusations, notably saying that you can't rape a prostitute, and was not initially considered a serious suspect. Local police contacted the FBI and requested help after another body was found, and famed profiler John Douglas was brought in to assist the investigation. Douglas theorized that the killer would be an experienced hunter with low self-esteem and a history of being rejected by women and would feel compelled to keep souvenirs of his murders, such as a victim's jewelry or even body parts. He came to suspect Hansen upon learning of Hansen's hunting skill and socially isolated childhood. Police searched Hansen's house on October 27, 1983, and found jewelry belonging to the victims, newspaper clippings about the murders, and an array of firearms, including a .223 caliber Mini-14 rifle. He was arrested and days later charged with assault, kidnapping, weapons offenses, theft, and insurance fraud. When ballistics tests returned matching bullets found at the crime scenes to Hansen's rifle, he entered into a plea bargain in which he pleaded guilty to the four homicides the police knew about and provided details about his other victims in return for serving his sentence in a federal prison. He then showed investigators 15 grave sites in the Nick River Valley, 12 of which police were unaware of. Robert Christian Hansen was sentenced to 461 years in prison without the possibility of parole and was imprisoned at Spring Creek Correctional Center, Seward, Alaska. Hansen died in 2014 of natural causes age 75 at Alaska Regional Hospital in Anchorage. A native of the Bronx, born in 1951, Doug Gretzler was drifting aimlessly around the country when he met 28-year-old Willie Steelman on October 11, 1973. Once committed to a mental institution, Steelman had compiled a lengthy record of arrests around Lodi, California, serving prison time on conviction of forgery. He recognized a kindred soul on sight, and soon the men became inseparable, trolling the Southwest in their search for victims, stealing to finance their travels, and Steelman's heroin addiction. On October 28, 1973, they invaded a house trailer near Mesa, Arizona, binding 19-year-old Robert Robbins and 18-year-old Catherine Mestiter, then shooting both victims to death. Drifting into Tucson, they killed 19-year-old Gilbert Sierra and dumped his body in the desert, doubling back to murder Michael and Patricia Sandberg in their Tucson apartment. On the Superstition Desert, Gretzler and Steelman found victim number six, leaving his body in the sleeping bag where he was shot to death. In Phoenix, the killers abducted Michael Adshade and Ken Unrain, both 22, dumping their nude bodies in a creek bed near Oakdale, California, rolling north in their stolen van. Authorities in Arizona had already issued warrants for Gretzler and Steelman by the time they reached Victor, California, 40 miles south of Sacramento, on November 6th. Walter and Joanne Parkin went bowling that night, leaving their two children, Lisa, 11, and Robert, 9, in the care of 18-year-old neighbor Deborah Earl. In the course of the evening, Deborah's parents dropped by to visit, along with brother Richard and her fiancé, 20-year-old Mark Lang. When the Parkins got home, they found a full house, including two strangers with guns. Carol Jenkins, a house guest of the Parkins, returned from a date around 3 a.m. and went directly to bed, taking the silent house for granted at that hour of the morning. Near dawn, she was roused from sleep by two friends of Mark Lang, who had spent the night trying to find him. Jenkins started a search of her own, stopping short when she found Walter and Joanne Parkin in the master bedroom, shot to death execution style.
Deputies responding to the call found seven more bodies jammed in the bedroom's walk-in closet. Victims had been gagged with neckties, bound with nylon cord, secured with as many as six knots in places, before they were massacred. In all, medical examiners would remove 25 slugs from nine bodies, plus one stray from Bob Parkin's pillow. Police published mugshots of Steelman, and Willie was recognized when he checked into a Sacramento hotel on November 8th. Police descended on the scene and both gunmen were swiftly arrested, booked on nine charges of first-degree murder. Gretzler cracked under interrogation, directing police to the scattered bodies of other victims while Steelman kept silent, refusing to enter a plea on the charges. In June 1974, Gretzler pled guilty to nine counts of murder, while Steelman submitted his case to a judge and was promptly convicted. On July 8th, both defendants were sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Drafted by the Navy in 1943, despite his best efforts to escape military service, Hall was dishonorably discharged after eight weeks of training. Back home in Little Rock, he married 19-year-old Fareen Clemens on March 14, 1944, but their relationship was a stormy one, marked by a brief separation in June. On September 28th, Hall paid a visit to his father-in-law, reporting that Fareen had deserted him three days earlier. Police were notified, logging reports of the young woman's promiscuous behavior, and they closed their investigation after a week, declaring her a probable runaway. Their theory was bolstered two months later, when relatives received a Christmas card with Fareen's signature, postmarked from Bakersfield, California. But Jim Hall borrowed the card and envelope before officers had a chance to examine it, and it was subsequently lost. On January 29, 1945, loggers discovered an abandoned car in Ouachita County, southwest of Little Rock. There was a dead man slumped behind the wheel, a bullet in his heart, identified from fingerprints as Camden Barber Carl Hamilton. The victim had been dead for several days when found, but homicide detectives had no reason to connect his murder with the disappearance of a wayward spouse in Little Rock. The toll began to mount on February 1st, when E.C. Adams vanished en route to his job at a Little Rock war plant. His car was found outside of Fordyce, northwest of Camden in Dallas County, and searchers located his body in some nearby brush, a single bullet in his brain. That same day, trucker Doyle Mulherin was reported long overdue on a scheduled meat delivery. His vehicle found hours later near Stuttgart, 40-odd miles to the southeast of Little Rock, in Arkansas County. A sweep of the area turned up his body, one shot through the head, his pockets emptied of $125 in company cash. Police were still without a suspect on March 2nd, when James Hall was arrested in a Little Rock bar fight, fined $106.90 on his plea of guilty to simple assault. Authorities became more interested in Hall when an acquaintance told of loaning him a car on January 28th. There was a loaded pistol in the glove compartment, and a single round was missing from the clip when Hall returned the car on January 29th. Ballistics tests revealed the gun had been used to kill Carl Hamilton. On March 9th, 1945, a burned-out car was found near Heber Springs, in Cleburne County. An incinerated body was recovered from the back seat, identified from dental charts as J.D. Newcomb Jr. of Little Rock. A search of James Hall's lodgings, meanwhile, had revealed substantial quantities of ammunition and shaving gear stolen from Hamilton. Picked up near Little Rock on March 15th, Hall readily confessed to the series of hold-up murders that had earned him less than $300 overall. He led detectives to the site where his wife was buried, Surprised to learn a farmer had retrieved the skull months earlier. Identified from crooked teeth, Fareen was finally laid to rest. Convicted of murder after a two-day trial, in May 1945, Hall was sentenced to death. While being escorted to the chair on January 4, 1946, he was all smiles, laughing and joking with his guards. Boys, I'm not afraid, he told them as they strapped him in and fastened the electrodes. I can take it. Hall died in the electric chair less than a year after his conviction. Penniless native Mexican Juan Corona arrived in Yuba City, California, sometime in the 1950s, and slowly built a more than respectable living as a labor contractor. He was respected and seemingly happily married with children, but he was also a schizophrenic and a sexual sadist who turned to murder in the spring of 1971. Corona found workers in the steady flow of migrant laborers coming out of his home country and just plain vagrants that were looking for a paycheck. Most were men that were transient in nature and not likely to be missed. 
he would simply select a new worker, one that was usually owed money, kill them, and then bury them. The disappearances never raised any concerns as workers often just up and left without notice. A fruit farmer in the area found a hole dug on his property on May 19th. When the man checked on the mysterious hole the next day, it was filled up. Even to a simple farmer, it was obvious that this was more than likely a grave for someone or something, and he called the police. Kenneth Whitaker was dug up from the earth, his throat and head hacked viciously, and his upper body stabbed repeatedly. A search for more graves turned up more than anyone would have imagined, and by early June the total had reached 25 bodies, all men who had been seen with or had gotten their jobs through Corona's labor contracting business. He was arrested for the murders, and tried, and though there were murmurings of an accomplice, Corona was found guilty and given 25 separate life sentences in January of 1973. After barely surviving a stabbing attack in prison, Corona won an appeal for a new trial about a decade after the original. The basis was that he had been improperly defended and that new evidence would point to his own brother as the true murderer. The second trial was a money-wasting sham, and Corona was sent back to the California penal system to continue serving out his life sentences. Corona was denied parole eight times and died on March 4, 2019, aged 85 from natural causes. Please like and subscribe for more Murder Mindset videos. Our twice-weekly videos aim to give you a quick and concise insight into the world's most prolific killers. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.